warm welcome to all of you to yet another edition of What Works, What Doesn't and Why Insights from Evaluation. And today we will be discussing Independent Evaluation Department's Annual Evaluation Review 2022. The AER assesses the operational performance and results of ADB based on findings from IED's evaluations and validations and is one of the three annual corporate performance reports produced by ADB. The other two reports are SPD's Development Effectiveness Review and PPFT's Annual Portfolio Performance Report. SPD's Development Effectiveness Review is an annual report by ADB Management which assesses the bank's progress in achieving the priorities of its corporate strategy. And PPFT's Annual Portfolio Performance Report provides analysis of the performance trends, size, composition, and quality of ADB's active portfolio. Now coming back to IED's AR 2022. Uh, the main report prepared by the team led by team leader Song Shin assessed ADB's performance. AR special theme chapter led by co-team leader Hyun Song presents an in-depth assessment of ADB's engagement in fragile and conflict-affected situations and small island developing states. Both Song and Hyun are here with us right now, and in case any of you have questions of them, please do not hesitate and you can ask them in the dedicated designated question and answer session, which Manny will announce, uh, who is, uh, uh, you know, today he's going to be moderating the session. Um, at this point, let me invite Song uh, to make a short presentation on the report. Song? This presentation uh, summarizes the key findings from IED's 2022 Annual Evaluation Review. I would like to first share uh, the findings on the operational performance and key drivers of effectiveness in ADB projects. As shown in the figure to the left, uh, the percentage of successful sovereign operations steadied at 70% in the evaluation period 2019 to 2021 with improved performance for all criteria except for efficiency. And sustainability remains the lowest rated criterion. Also, the proportion of successful non-sovereign operations marginally improved to 55% uh, from 53% in 2018 to 2020 period. Country program success declined to 68% in 2019 to 2021 caused by the decline in effectiveness and persisting low sustainability of country programs. AER also looked into the key drivers of effectiveness, uh, which found that project design quality and active monitoring were found to be the key drivers in improving effectiveness for both sovereign and non-sovereign operations. Related to implementation of IED recommendations, it was found that there was stronger acceptance rate of IED recommendations to 95% during period of 2017 to 2021 due to the continuing management efforts to act on issues and concern raised by IED evaluations and also the effect of management action record system progress reform which occurred in 2017. However, um, implementation of accepted recommendations from 2017 to 2021 period has been less with 77% of recommendations rated fully or largely implemented. Also, um, among the recommendations that became due in 2021, uh, better alignment of recommendations and action plan continues with 84% of implementation success rate. Related to the special theme chapter assessing ADB's engagement in FCAS and SIDS, it was found that ensuring equal attention to active conflict and institutional fragilities is imperative when implementing ADB's FCAS-related approaches. Also, building resilience in FCAS SIDS is a multidimensional challenge that requires ADB's long-term capacity development, support, and its enhanced collaboration with other development organizations. Furthermore, ADB's partnership with humanitarian and development agencies are crucial in bring, bridging relief and development in FCAS and CIS, especially in conflict-affected areas. It was also found that ADB's country and 
pro project level monitoring framework and indicators need to be better tailored to FCAS and SIDS context. These are the key summaries of the findings. Thank you. Back to you, Salia. Thank you, Song. And as I had said earlier, both Song and Hyun will be available during today's discussion to answer any questions you may have on the report. Now, it is our endeavor to ensure that uh, IED's knowledge platforms are inclusive. And so we have some reactions from our resident missions on AI 2022. Let's hear what they have to say. I support IAD's call for better donor collaboration in supporting long-term capacity and governance reforms, as well as timely humanitarian assistance for FCAS and SIDS. A predictable and well-coordinated development assistance from donors will help promote good governance, obtain country ownership, and mobilize local support to structural institutional reforms in FCAS and SIDS countries. As a staff working in the field, I see the critical importance of development coordination in achieving results in difficult environments. I agree with IED's recommendation to incorporate conflict or fragility sensitive narratives and indicators in the country and project results frameworks to help ADB monitor performance and results in FCAS and SEEDS. Such frameworks will be useful in determining the extent to which countries are transitioning out of fragility and conflict. As the report highlights, I would like to mention improved supervision and monitoring has been the key drivers for effectiveness. Continuous monitoring and supervision give us early warnings to identify upcoming challenges and the extra commitment project staff required to put in place to achieve the desired results. Executing and implementing agency capacity and the commitment is vital throughout the project life cycle and strong commitment has provided smooth and efficient results. In Sri Lanka, we have seen strong commitment from executing and implementing agencies for finance sector projects and has resulted positive project outputs. On the project effectiveness, I understand that ADB's projects are facing uh, challenges on the project efficiency for which it related to the um, executing agency commitment and capacity as well as the project design. As an officer, we found that during the implementation, we found many gaps between the project design and ADB's policy with the government's regulation. It results in underachievement of some of the project targets. For example, in my sector, the urban sector, we are facing difficulties in applying the wastewater tariff setting and it creates risk for the long-term sustainability. So in the future, while um, still maintaining ADP's policy and regulation, I think the project must be designed to fit with the client's needs, the government's needs, and then the project's target should be aligned with the government's commitment and capacity. The project period should also be aligned and set in a realistic timeline. And overall, the project design must be aligned with the government's regulation to avoid any potential issues during implementation. And lastly, a client-centric approach, responsiveness, and flexibility are very, very important in designing a successful and efficient project. So now it's time for me to introduce you to the panelists. But before I do, uh, do that, let me quickly remind you that for those of you who have questions, and I encourage all of you to ask questions, you may place them in the chat box. And for the panelists, please turn on your videos when I introduce you. We have with us today, Alternate Executive Director, David Kavanaugh, Kenichi Yokoyama, Director General, South Asia Department, and Lu Shen, Director, Results Management and Aid Effectiveness Division, that is SPRA, Strategy, Policy and Partnership Department. And uh, today's uh, discussion will be moderated by DGIED, Manny Jimenez. Manny, it's over to you now. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Saleha. We're very lucky to have with us uh, today a very distinguished set of panelists who bring really distinct perspectives on performance uh, of ADV operations. 
uh, we have from the senior management in charge of operations, someone from the board, and uh, someone who actually provides oversight of all ADB operations. So welcome, Ken, David, and Lou. Uh, so uh, for all of you, I'm going to have a conversation uh, with uh, our colleagues. And in the meantime, uh, as Saleha mentioned, I invite you to prepare questions and in the chat, and we'll try to make sure that we get to them as we go along. Uh, so let me start with you, uh, Ken, if I may. Uh, during the evaluation period, uh, 2019 to uh, 2021, uh, performance in, uh, on average across ADB regions declined or remained the same, except for South Asia, where performance uh, actually improved slightly. And this was driven uh, primarily in sectors like transport, which is a sector across ADB has been uh, actually experiencing con continuous declines in performance indicators over the past uh, three uh, reporting periods. So can you just share with us some insights on um, South Asia's relatively strong performance during this, this time and any lessons you might think might be uh, replicable for uh, other regions? So Ken? Uh, thank you, Mani, for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, actually, South Asia, like other uh, regional departments, we take the uh, overall performance of the project completion report uh, very seriously, actually, because it's one of the you know indicators always reported in the uh, annual evaluation report and also corporate result framework. So for us, uh, this is a very important uh, subject, and we have actually as SARD, we have a PCR uh, front office team looking after the PCR performance. It's part of the project portfolio performance, and uh, over the past years, we established a system like country-wide, sector-wide, the overall rating of the success rate. So we can see uh, in a, a kind of you know uh, Excel sheet which countries, which sector over the past five six years, what are their uh, success rate? And uh, uh, frankly, uh, the great greatest challenge as of now is the India urban sector. I, I think the rate is somewhere like still forty percent or less. And then uh, we have a database also which uh, evaluation you know criteria is weakest. And particularly, we know that uh, sustainability is an issue as well as the uh, effectiveness. So we have uh, been progressively strengthening a system. And uh, I think actually last year, slight improvement, but there were also several, I think five, six projects where ID downgraded. So we had hoped actually more, much better improvement. So about, uh, I think we try to take a systematic approach of uh, clearly seeing which you know sectors, which countries, which criteria needs to pretty much focus. And now we have also strengthened our uh, portfolio system that each project at the time of uh, uh, midterm review uh, must uh, project the prior assessment, a preliminary assessment of, of the PCR rating and identify the, uh, the gaps and then try to address this before project completion. So that, that arrangement is also being pursued. And uh, also uh, there is uh, at this moment the area of uh, disagreements between regional departments and uh, IED. So we are listing those out and uh, uh, also consulting, uh, approaching money uh, and group to, to, to discuss how those uh, the area of disagreement. Some of them are interpretation of the IED evaluation guidelines. We need a, a clearer uh, you know, or the these uh, in, I mean, guidelines as to what are really the uh, this uh, rating criteria for individual evaluation items, and in this process, our PCR, uh, you know, front office team is also uh, contacting with all the regional department uh, front office uh, PCR teams, and we are also trying to call, uh, you know do a mutual uh, I mean, information exchange and uh, collaboration. So I, I, I'll stop here and uh, wish to give any further clarification needed. Thank you. You know, very, very good uh, response, uh, uh, Kenichi uh, San. Uh, now over to you, Lou. Um, thank you for uh, for joining us. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we had done in this year's AER was to put in an additional emphasis and focus on uh, effectiveness performance. So we were looking to see what were some of the key drivers 
uh, for underperformance with regard to, to effectiveness. And what we found was, um, you know, there were two, two key drivers. One was project design at entry and two was uh, weak monitoring. And these were identified as two critical issues resulting in, in lower performance. Uh, from where you are, you've been uh, you know, overseeing the results uh, from the self-evaluation point of view uh, across ADB. What do you think are the causes for this trend and uh, what steps are being taken to, to address this? Over to you, Lou. Thanks, Nathan, and thank you for inviting me to yet another IED, what works and what doesn't um, and why. I think this is really a great forum for us to have this conversation. And like you said, you know, in terms of project effectiveness, it's one of the perennial challenges that we have, right? Um, so uh, you're right, uh, project design as well as project implementation has direct impact on the project performance. Um, and, you know, if you're looking at some of the issues and I will start with the sovereign side, um, one of the things was actually an easy fix, relatively speaking, is the DMF quality, right? And so if you look at projects that were approved prior to 2010, 46% of the projects that were rated less than effective were due to the poor DMF design, right? And so this is one of the things that we we felt like we had a tool and we had a way to fix it. And so in my division, we, we really amped up the quality control over the DMFs and teaching the teams to understand what are some of the more realistic targets they should set for themselves, right? Uh, rather than kind of like this grand grandiose targets that they said that they cannot possibly achieve. And so I think that you see a, a, a really significant improvement in terms of the project at entry of what they're proposing to achieve under their DMFs, both, both in terms of outputs as well as outcomes. Right, and making that direct linkage to a uh, linkage to what the project can uh, attribute versus um, versus what it cannot. Um, the second part is really uh, looking at and and this I would actually um, you know um, wanted to to acknowledge that South Asia has done a wonderful job in terms of implementation readiness, right? Because we talk about procurement readiness, we talk about design readiness, um, but I think that's subject to interpretation by a lot of departments. And South Asia is very good in making that very, very standard and very objective way of, of, of saying what, what does ready, readiness really mean? Because I think this really impacts how the project implementation goes and how the project and eventually performs. Um, and the last part, and I, I noticed that during the videos, a, a lot of our resubmission colleagues have talked about EAI capacity. And our role is really to help them identify the risks, right? And do the preventative ma maintenance, so to speak, and before the problems arise, um, but to anticipate them and also to resolve them before they become too big to handle. And I think that will help us achieve the outputs that we want at the project level. On the non-sovereign side, I think it's a very different story. And, and I think, you know, uh, year on year, you have various data points, right? Sometimes it's just a handful of projects that you're you're defining what the trend is. And so, so I, I think, you know, we, we need to be a little bit more cautious about sort of saying what, what are the trends versus what are the underlying issues, right? Um, so, so I think on, you know, the PSOD colleagues, and we have talked about this quite a bit, is their ex ante assessment tool, right, to to look at the project at, uh, at entry and look at the, the um, you know, um, the, the way that the projects are actually uh, achieving development impact. And I know that this, pro uh, this ex ante tool has been in the pilot phase for a while, but I think it's really coming on strong in terms of, you know, making that a, 
creating that discipline at, at the at the beginning. And the other thing that they do, um, what I understand at least, is that for uh, the monitoring tool during implementation, it's on the development effectiveness monitoring tool, right? And so I think they use this to take actions and address projects that are um, suffering from issues and challenges and try to resolve them on a timely basis. Um, and the other thing, I think this is more broad and we can discuss later, um, which is about resources, right? So it, it's really about input output. So I, I think we, we spend a lot of resources in project preparation, how much of these resources should be reallocated to implementation, how, how should we be managing our staff um, and, and to, to address these issues. I think that's uh, a big, big item. Um, I know that have rambled on, but I will stop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. And I think you, you brought up a number of important points, and I think we can come back uh, to engage you further on the monitoring and evaluation systems, right, which is the strength of the systems and the quality of data that is there, whose responsibility is it to upkeep and update that system and so okay. on. So so we'll, we'll come back to you, but a lot of good good points and a lot of good Yeah, just one more thing, and I just wanted to, I forgot this, but um, I wanted to echo DG Kanichi on, on the point about kind of uh, narrowing that gap between PCR and PBR. So validation exercise and um, the interpretation and application of the guidelines. I think that's super crucial. So I'm so happy to hear that um, the regional departments is also having this as on, on the top of their list. So I'll stop, thanks. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, so David, uh, welcome back. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I want to, uh, you know, ask you a very, very broad question, right? Uh, you know, you, you, your constituency is a big advocate for a number of Pacific countries, and uh, we know the operations in the Pacific are very challenging uh, for various issues, uh, their inherent fragility, capacity issues, and so on, right? Uh, when we look at uh, the success rate in the Pacific region, it's at around 50%, about only half of the projects are successful. Uh, what do you see from the position where you are in and based on the longstanding experience that you bring, uh, what do you see as uh, the persistent challenges in addressing the issues in the Pacific? And where do you think ADB can do better uh, to make Make these implementations uh, more successful. Over to you, David. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Um, so obviously, the Pacific countries and Pacific members have uh, a, a lot of persistent challenges. You, you, took, you mentioned, you know, the, the very low success rates, uh, and it's consistently low, and it hasn't changed, and it's um, been hovering around fifty percent level for quite a while. Um, stemming from that is obviously the remoteness is you know a, a key factor. When I was working in the Solomon Islands, one of the people in my team would spend four days uh, to get to his um, his town, his his, his province uh, by boat within the, within the country. Uh, also on remoteness, not just within the country, but getting there, um, you can spend you know a, a week or so getting to different uh, Pacific Island members um, as well as back, as well as the difficulty if something does go wrong um, with, you know, for example, a, a port or, or access. Um, so remoteness is a, a key consideration. Um, obviously, they're very, very small economies. You know, some of the members are as small as one and a half thousand people. Um, I guess the smallest in my constituency is about uh, 10,000 odd. So they're, they're very small. And within that size, they need to do everything. They need to do as much as what a, a suburb in Australia, um, you know, does in effect. So uh, so remote list, very small. And I'd probably say the other one, which is probably undervalued, or I guess probably not mentioned as much, is the fact that many of these are, are newly formed countries, newly formed governments, uh, you know, many from the late 70s onwards. So they don't have that depth of institution. They don't have that depth of decision making. They don't have that depth of you know, coming together as, as a country uh, together. So so you know you don't have that that depth also of um, investment in in education. So some of the Pacific members, uh, you know, Fiji might have been one, which was more of a um, uh, where they might have had sent some of the elites uh, locals to to Oxford and those sort of trainings. But other ones, they didn't have that that depth of education. So you're really coming from a, a very nascent uh, country and very nascent decision making. So all of these need to be taken into consideration when you're 
trying to you know build capacity and and you know develop government skills and 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 bring people together from from you know from different provinces different uh, backgrounds different languages a, ho a whole mix even though they might be very small uh, country you know PNG has over a thousand languages etc so um, these are uh, large challenges which create problems of uh, obviously when it comes to ODA of um, you know dependency ultimately we would like to reduce that whether or not that's possible at the end of the day for many of the members is another thing and the other one is because they're so small as stability um, you know at the whim of um, the world anything that changes uh, you look at um, I had a discussion this morning about uh, Timor-Leste and you know a lot of their exports are, um, are natural gas well that you know that's US dollar uh, de denominated, so it just makes it very hard for other export um, industries if you're competing against, you know, a, a US dollar. Um, so, so there's those kind of issues. In terms of uh, changes for ADB, I, I think the Pacific approach uh, and FCAS SIDS approach provides a very good guidance or framework uh, in which to to leap from. But obviously, it needs to be implemented at the end of the day, and then that's what um, you know we're very much interested in, and also interested in seeing the resources uh, that are allocated to that implementation, um, particularly on the ground resources. Um, we don't feel that that's yet to be done. Um, uh, the Pacific Department in general, through uh, many evaluations, also shown that it has been under-resourced compared to other departments, given the number and the difficulty of projects. So we're really wanting to see a lot more um, of that sort of detailed planning approach rather than the framework, but how that's actually going to be um, you know, done on the ground. I guess more broadly, uh, in terms of you know uh, ADB's ability to provide an, a differentiated approach, it'd be great to see greater integration of, of quality staff. You know, going through the Pacific Department, getting their skills, getting their on the ground expertise. Uh, also, the other way, you know, greater employment of Pacific staff within the ADB in general, but also uh, outside of the Pacific Department. So I think that would, you know, in, in general, encourage a, a greater understanding of, of SIDS and, and needs for that differentiated approach. Uh, it would be, uh, I, um, the, the bank's getting a lot bigger than this, but drawing on, you know, regional synergies where possible, such as through technical assistance or knowledge sharing, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see a greater use of the hubs um, and, and drawing on those uh, broader, broader skill sets. Uh, but obviously making sure that these hubs don't become silos themselves. So obviously ongoing um, monitoring role. Um, and, and I guess another challenge or a change for uh, ADB in, with the Pacific members is also increasing the role of non-sovereign operations and a, a key interest for us because obviously, you know, governments and, and donors can't do, can't do everything and can't be everything. So what we're looking to see is definitely taking um, a, a portfolio approach and really supporting initiatives with a, with a strong development impact. Um, so thanks, Nathan. Thank you, David, and a lot of excellent points there. Looks like Manny is back on. So let me pass the baton back to Manny uh, uh, to go through with the rest of the panel. Over to you, Manny. Thank you very much, Nathan, for stepping in so adroitly uh, during our technical glitch. But let me try to continue the conversation. Uh, and Nathan did a great job to, uh, to step in. Uh, uh, and I have a question actually uh, for uh, for Ken and, and Lou and, and Lou maybe you first on uh, a lot of the uh, uh, changes that are being uh, discussed at uh, during the discussions on the re organizational review have a lot to do with uh, performance of uh, ADB operations and how to improve it. Uh, and uh, it's something that I know is near and dear to, to your heart. What are the sort of the main uh, initiatives that you see coming up that you think really ought to be front and center in this organizational review? And just to warn you, Ken, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you the same question from the country perspective. So, Lou? Uh, that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? Um, and so you're, you're absolutely right. I, I feel like the organizational review has been an opportunity for us to really rethink how we do our business, right? And so um, I, I think there's a couple of different things um, and in no particular order. I think for some, you know, I, I would just go through them as, as, I, as I think about them. And one is really this idea of local presence, right? And so to have that 
uh, closer to the client, uh, having this regional hubs and having more people out and the resolutions to be closer to the client. I think that is really, really key because the proximity to the client means that we can, number one, better understand their needs and design our projects in the way that, you know, it's fit for, pur for purpose, but it's also the fact that we can then also be closer to them during the whole project cycle, right? Um, so that's one. And two is uh, the, the, the thought that we are thinking about this matrix organization where you have the sector groups all kind of aligned together. And part of the thinking I think behind that is that oftentimes when you have project design versus project implementation, you're dealing with different people. And so uh, um, maybe it's when you're designing a project, you don't think about the granularities and what could go wrong during implementation, right? And so having that accountability throughout the project cycle is something that we've been really pushing for uh, to, to, to really create that accountability, but also to have people think a little bit more, right? Not to just have a pretty product at the beginning of the project cycle, but something that is implementable, something that is realistic. And 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 I think there's that that's a really important point for me. And coming from the water sector, you know, this is or, or the urban sector for for that matter, where we we have suffered a lot in terms of the different issues. I think this will make a lot of uh, changes, um, you know, in in how we actually uh, you know design and implement our projects. Um, the other thing that I would say is. Um, resource allocation, and I had mentioned this before, and, and it's really about the effective and efficient use of resources, right? What is the right balance between available resources and key areas? What is expected from, 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 from people using these resources? I think those are the kind of things that need to be made clear. Um, and, and I think this is a, another one of the drivers behind the organizational review is that how do you set common uh, objectives and how do you um, develop that set of metrics that uh, you know give uh, give people no matter where you sit in the organization to have this common goal and um, and then use the resources to 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 kind of achieve that. So I think I'll stop there and um, I'm sure DG Kenichi has a lot more to add to this as well. No, Over thanks back to you, Penny. You know, thank you very much, Lou. I can tell this is a real passion with you, uh, Ken. Uh, over to you, I think from uh, sort of the uh, regional perspective, uh, you're the point of the spear uh, on uh, uh, ADB effectiveness. What are the kind of changes that uh, you'd like to see uh, addressed uh, in the organizational review to help you do your job better? Well, I, I think uh, already uh, Liu has mentioned the uh, better integration of uh, HQ and the uh, resident missions can definitely help. And uh, at this moment, uh, frankly, yeah, so this uh, RM review has uh, started the process of uh, better uh, integration, but there has been, a, uh, honestly speaking, a kind of a divide between HQ sector divisions and uh, RM sector teams. And uh, RM sector teams looking primarily on implementation and uh, HQ sector divisions primarily looking at the project processing. Uh, so uh, definitely more if more you know people are coming uh, as a, to the regional hub and uh, join uh, not only processing but also regular interactions on implementation side uh, can definitely help uh, improving our performance and definitely also you know the strategy 2030 also emphasizes our engagement to, to even more more and more uh, kind of a transformative uh, futuristic uh, interventions which are not conventional you know a single sector focused kind of project so uh, implementation is uh, uh, even more and more challenging and uh, uh, differentiating uh, you know implementation and upstream uh, sector reforms is uh, uh, also getting uh, i mean quite uh, difficult so in, so in that sense, this organizational review, uh, having uh, better integration uh, between and more uh, I mean, uh, uh, professional staff working in the hub or region will uh, definitely be helpful. 
and uh, yes, and also we expect to, you know, integration of the national staff and the international staff. There are already uh, lots of lots of regional uh, level national officers who can be assigned to, you know, neighboring countries regional assignments, and uh, you know they they have a very strong capacity. Like some of the you know India Bangladeshi staff can support to uh, smaller and uh, challenging countries like Bhutan and Maldives. So opportunities are there, and we really wish to see uh, this uh, in increasingly happening. And I'm sure. Uh, that can help to improve our uh, overall uh, performance. Thank you. Okay, so I think maybe Manny still has uh, some issues with uh, his connection. So uh, let me uh, carry the panel on, right? Uh, now, you know, re really good uh, feedback from, from Lou and Kenichi uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how, what the new organizational review can do and uh, how can we sharpen it so that effectiveness and development impact on the ground is further improved. Uh, you know, now I see on the chat box, there is a number of questions that's been placed from the floor uh, here. Um, you know, I'm uh, looking at a question here on FCAS and SITS. Um, let, me, let me read this. Um, this probably, uh, A.D. David can probably, if he's still on, or, uh, or maybe I can direct this question to Lou as well, which is, uh, when we talk about FCAS, conflict situations attract a lot of news headlines, but fragility aspect is usually not emphasized. Uh, how should development partners approach conflict and fragility risks? Um, this is something that David uh, had touched upon a little bit when he talked about how we address uh, the situation in the Pacific countries. Um, uh, Lou, now that we're waiting on David, probably there's another thunderstorm in, in ADV. Uh, maybe you can take this on and then we can come back to David with a different question. Um, do you mean the one on the, I, I see in the chat box on implementation readiness? No, you know, right? maybe you can first talk about, you know, with regard to fragility, right? How should development partners approach conflict and fragility? Should, you know, in terms of, or maybe you can talk about development readiness if that is something that you want to take on at this point. This is. Yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, definitely uh, AED Kavanaugh is probably in a better position to kind of talk about FCA. So I will stick with um, the second question that I see where it's uh, about the implementation readiness. Right. And it, this is a really important point, right? Because. Right. Um, and so um, this question is about what specific aspects of readiness have often been exactly. missing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think my understanding, and uh, DG Kanichi can can also speak to this, is that SARD is very, um, you know, it's very, very clear when they talk about readiness, right? When you're talking about procurement readiness, it's about having the package ready to go prior to approval, right? Or, um, or having the design readiness um, be kind of like the design is clearly there and demonstrated by the teams rather than just the project team saying, yes, we're design ready or yes, we're procurement ready. And, and, and I think this could make a huge difference depending on which country you're in, right? Where the processes could be very long um, in countries where I work in Kyrgyzstan or, you know, in Uzbekistan where, you know, having the tender process not being completely done makes a huge difference, right? And so having that having that level of scrutiny at the department level to demonstrate, you know, that you're actually procurement ready or you're actually design ready, that hugely helps, right, the process uh, rather than sort of saying that, yeah, we're design ready and have it approved and, you know, have the project sit um, because you run into issues because then it turns out that you're not actually ready. So so I think that was um, my understanding of what SART does differently is, is being a little bit more strict at the beginning, but really, you know, have it pay off later. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lu. Ken, if, do you want to add anything to... Uh... So things that SARD is doing to improve uh, implementation readiness and how that is having an impact on development effectiveness. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, this uh, readiness, we have a, a readiness checklist to essentially establish with the you know, client government. 
and uh, originating from the mid 2000s when ADB South Asia's performance, particularly India, you know, we started a lot of infrastructure works, but uh, initially, uh, you know, performance was not so good and the net resource transfer sometimes negative. So uh, we established this system of, uh, I mean, readiness uh, at, at that time. And it includes uh, not only design readiness, but the procurement readiness, like, like uh, before negotiation, at least 30 percent of the contracts uh, should be ready for signing. And uh, more than 50 percent of the land must have been acquired. And the project management office, uh, P project director and account staff should have been, uh, you know, the uh, fully appointed. And so, so those are essentially elements that we ensure. And, but of course, you know, South Asia uh, on the implementation side still weak. So uh, unless we, we got high readiness in the end, uh, you know, still we face uh, lots of, uh, you know, time over run. And uh, uh, I think we are still on the average in terms of the PCR, PBI performance. So readiness is paying off, but the implementation we are now uh, stepping up also. Uh, uh, for higher discipline. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Th thank you, Kenichi san. Uh, so, D D David, um, you know, uh, let me come back to you. You know, you had um, uh, given us a lot of pointers on how to engage with the Pacific better and how um, ADB can improve its implementation. There is a question here from the floor on, um, you know, different, the number of development partners that are there on the ground. There is many, many development partners that are engaged in the fragile and conflict affected situations, including in the Pacific. Uh, you know, like fragility always makes the headlines, uh, but rarely fragility aspect is being emphasized. So the question is how should development partners approach conflict and fragility risks specifically? Um, yeah, so my experience uh, um, was basically working within the Ministry of Finance, within the Solomon Islands Ministry of uh, Finance and Treasury for three and a half years. Um, this is post their uh, post their conflict. So a, a lot of it was about building um, back the you know the right frameworks and creating that stability, uh, in a sense, and, and certainty, uh, so that um, I guess government and business and people can can go about their business. So a, a lot of that requires a general multifaceted approach. Uh, obviously, that term's used a fair bit, but it's uh, in the Solomon Islands. In the case, it was you know underpinned by security, but involved working across a range of different areas, whether it's Obviously, a strong um, engagement with with government, particularly the key decision makers, but also um, you know with the private sector and, and, and CSOs, etc. So strong coordination was involved, and strong, um, and it also required generally a, a long term approach and, and long term investment, and, and basically and, and being on the ground as well. Um, in terms of the, the different types of approaches, uh, flexibility was obviously key. Uh, you have the momentum, whether it's uh, whether it's the you know the, 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 for example a strong ministry of finance, or whether it's uh, another there might be a, a particular personality who's able to, to make changes. So being able to adjust to where you have momentum, and then realizing where you can't have momentum, being able to shift away from that to other to other areas. So so really taking advantage of, of opportunities as they arise. Uh, and in these particular environments, you know, things are quite quite changeable. Uh, focusing on the capacity development of people, uh, not just that, but systems and institutions. Uh, I, I guess one of the key things that we look for in um, in ADB's role in, in these particular areas is obviously not just, you know, the, the training sides of capacity building, but really taking that sort of hands-on approach to, to recognising the capacity limitations and strengthening, you know, project management um, support in, in general, or assisting the you know the private sector to be able to to put in bids, uh, or just generally just more of that hand holding and re realizing that things um, you know don't always proceed in in, in normal ways. Uh, some of the things that uh, I would used to do in in the Solomon Islands would you know involve you know for example, say they're about to get a, a new loan, is actually driving around getting documents signed um, to people's. You know, to ministers' houses, etc. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll finish up. So a couple of the other things that I think work um, is obviously the controversial areas around capacity supplementation or working around systems uh, when things don't. Obviously, they need strong monitoring and used very sparingly and significant consideration. But you can definitely see how uh, or having or just um, broader support or general recruitment practices, etc. 
I think I'm cutting in and out just a little bit more. So uh, I might leave it there. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you, David. Uh, we'll come back to you. I think hopefully the connection gets a little bit better in a couple of minutes. Now, there is a question here for IED itself. Is, uh, is IED applying a differentiated approach uh, on how it assesses FCAS and SIDS? I believe FCAS and SIDS should not be measured in the same yardstick as other economies. Hyun, do you want to uh, take a crack at this? Yes, uh, I can do that. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, my answer to the question pivots around the principles of evaluation. Uh, I think regardless of whether DMC is classified as FCAS or CIS, the principles of evaluation should be the same when undertaking evaluations. I mean, in evaluating projects in FCAS and CIS, there is no need to uh, lower performance threshold or targets. Uh, what is needed is to strengthen uh, m and &E systems of projects implemented in this context by using uh, context-specific indicators and narratives on, uh, on the conflict or fragility risk that affect ADB performance in a particular DMC. That's what uh, somebody on the video was saying. And as our uh, theme chapter notes, uh, important step in revamping uh, measurements of FCAS or CIS performance is the use of uh, uh, results framework that incorporate conflict or fragility sensitive indicators and uh, narratives. So what is needed is the context specific data and information in country and project monitoring uh, framework that provided the basis for evaluation. Uh, I think as um, uh, ADB's FCAS team uh, in SDC has noted during our consultation meeting with them, support for FCAS and CIS is all about good development which is applicable uh, across ADB portfolio and not just the selected countries. So in the same vein, IED's evaluation criteria of relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, and sustainability, which are in sync with the international standards apply to all DMCs, including those in FCA senses. Nathan, I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hyun. I think it's a, it's a very important point that uh, Hyun makes, right, that there is a standardized framework for assessing, you know, all operations in all different contexts. But what needs to change is the approach to these operations and the framework that is used, which is the DMF and the targets and the baseline that is being used and the different types of interventions that are being deployed in, in, in this context. And so that is what she's highlighting. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Hune. And I think that is in line with a number of other messages that David had talked about as well, which is needs to be a differentiated approach for, for Pacific, a lot more on capacity and knowledge building. So uh, there's a question here, um, Lou, on the organizational review, um, you know, let me let me throw this to you. You know, maybe you and uh, Kenichi San can also opine on this. Which is, it says here that the recent communication on organizational review showcases the country focus, which is strengthening the RMs, which Kenichi San also talked about, but and the change of business processes, right? Uh, but did not say anything about regional hubs. So um, I think regional hubs is something that AED um, David also referred to, especially with, re with regard to the Pacific. Uh, maybe your views on that, and then we'll, we'll go to Kenichi San on, on his views as well. Uh, yeah, so it's a very good question. And, and I think the way that I would frame it is that the organizational, the organizational review is a kind of a medium term process, right? It's not something that we can do overnight. And so I think the concept is that the RM review, uh, the RM strengthening, right? The business processes that we can change, those are software um, to a certain extent and some kind of you know, incremental changes that we can make uh, using a basis that we already have. Whereas the regional hubs is something uh, I, I, I think that the organizational review team 
definitely has that in in mind in terms of being like a, a central part of the the new the new way that ADB works. But but I think that maybe the reason why the communication hasn't been as clear is that this is kind of a work in progress, right? And so identifying where the hubs will make sense and how this whole um, resource allocation will work because it's not, you know, about it's not a budget neutral kind of exercise, I wouldn't imagine. And so I think there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into that, um, as well as, um, you know, the, the actual logistics of getting it done. So um, I definitely will require uh, request people to have patience when it comes to the org review, um, because it is a complex issue that we're trying to address. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Uh, thanks, thanks, Liu. Uh, over to you, Kenichi san, because I think there is uh, two different approaches here, right? Regional hubs provide you ec much more economies of scale. You can have a bigger operation in a big regional hub. And these regional hubs, if you locate the right cities, you will have better capacities as well. And so it's easier to operate in these regional hubs as well with, versus the smaller RMs that David was talking about. So your views, uh, do you prefer one or the other? What are the challenges on having one or the other? Uh, vis a vis SARDs operations? Uh, for us, yeah, we need to uh, actually, we want to have a bit more clarity about what the regional hub means from uh, organizational review team. But from our perspective, it would be best. I, I don't think at this stage we should uh, say that there should be one regional hub within the region. It can be, you know, we have uh, actually outsourced, outposted staff in Kathmandu. Uh, Delhi, Dhaka, uh, so various places. So we can imagine uh, some staff posted in Kathmandu covering primarily Nepal, but also India and other countries. And uh, some staff may be posted in Delhi and do the same, uh, you know, like uh, covering pri primarily India, but also Nepal and so on. So, uh, and then we have recently a, a SASEC meeting. They also want the SASEC secretariat to be more close to, uh, you know, India. So in, in that sense, definitely, uh, you know, we envisage more staff uh, or, you know, or, I mean, IS position may be divided into regional positions and so on. So we, we really wish to have more uh, staff uh, posted in, in the uh, region. So that's what we interpret as a regional hub. Not necessarily one, one concentrated place, but it can be, a, a, you know, several places working together close. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kenichi-san. Yeah, David, let me come back to you. We have only a few minutes left, but there is a question here, which is a very interesting one, uh, you know, that's tying up COVID and FCAS and SIDS, which is it's saying here, I'm paraphrasing, it's saying that, um, you know, there has been uh, severe strains on uh, various small economies, especially FCAS and SIDS, as a result of uh, COVID. And uh, this has uh, raised a number of fiscal sustainability issues in many of these countries. And so this complicates operations in these places even more. Uh, how would you, how can development partners support fiscal resilience of countries, especially FCAS and SIDS, given that we are now you know, in COVID recovery, it's really challenging. Uh, countries are in very, very difficult situations. Is there anything different that ADB can do um, from its normal practice? Uh, thanks, Nathan. I would probably say that the main thing, and I think the thing result, resulting a lot from uh, ADB's role throughout COVID is being really at the, the center of discussions of, of policy dialogue. I think it really gave uh, a lot of staff and resident missions the chance to to be on the ground to have those discussions and they're all very challenging conversations that need to be had and there's all trade-offs and and I guess there's always a balance to a lot of these approaches but by being uh, there by being able to discuss um, you know the, the pros and cons of different issues um, being able to you know use our convening power to be able to use our ability to to, to bring in others and to bring in expertise um, and, and hopefully with the organisation re, um, review process, um, you know, increased uh, being able to provide that, you know, on the ground support, um, we can provide that support um, you know, as needed, or at least that, that advice is needed. Um, I, I guess, they, you know, with every country that they are different, there's, uh, you know, debt constraints, there's fiscal constraints, 
Uh, there's, you know, the, the need to, to, to raise revenue, uh, but at the same time, you're looking at, you know, increasing social protection support, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a range of different challenges, but ultimately I think these are all complex ones. And um, I think it involves being uh, there on the ground, but also providing those broader um, assistance to be able to make informed decisions them, themselves uh, is, is what I would say without getting to specifics. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, David. And I think uh, this was a very, very rich discussion. We have reached uh, the end of the hour now. This was an excellent, very rich discussion that uh, covered various topics, right, from FCAS and sales to the Pacific to, you know, broadly results framework and also specifics in terms of uh, the organizational review and its implications on development effectiveness. Uh, and then uh, great contributions from all of you. We had a few technical glitches here. Um, I apologize for that. And I think uh, uh, hopefully uh, not much physical damage has happened at the ADB headquarters as a result of this uh, thunderstorm that's probably gone through. Uh, but, you know, I won't summarize um, or attempt to summarize everything that's been said. I want to thank all of you for the wonderful feedback and the contributions. Uh, let me hand it back uh, to Saleha uh, if you have any closing remarks before we close. And thank you so much, Nathan, for filling in. And it does seem like we defied the weather gods to bring this edition of What Works to all of you. Thank you very much for your patience, uh, panelists. And thank you very much, IED team, for ensuring that this is completely seamless. And that brings us to the end of this edition of What Works. But do not forget to fill in the surveys. And uh, we will always be responding to what you want us to do better at What Works. That's it for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Hopefully next time we see you all in person. Yes. See you. Bye. <laughs>